Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is episode number 253. Dos, cinco, tres. Dos, cinco, tres. Motherfuckers. Okay, my fingers are a bit weird here. I'm not really holding them up right, but you get the message. Hope you guys are doing well. Hope you guys are doing great. Hope you guys are doing fine. Hope you guys are healthy. Guys and girls. Women and men, men and women, whatever you may be, hope you guys are well. Good. Boom. Amazing. Nice. How am I doing? Fairly good, actually. I've had, again, a very quiet couple of weeks. You know, just chilling. At home. Going to work. Coming back. Running. Gym. DJing. Mixing. Reading books. Learning languages. You know? Just a standard old thing. I'm getting back into my room. I'm getting back into my rhythm. You know, once Sober October came around and I was able to kind of get my stuff into order and kind of figure out what I need to do, it made things a bit more clearer. And now I'm back where I need to be, back on that nice, straight and narrow path that I was on that I was on previously, but I kind of detoured on before, right? No fucking around. No um what do you call it? Yeah, just no distractions, you know, just keeping your keeping your eye on the prize. It's a bit difficult, don't get me wrong, but it's working pretty well at the moment. Um, what have I been enjoying? What have I been enjoying? What have I been up to enjoying wise? I've been enjoying um, listening to audiobooks. That's been a very um, pleasant experience over the last few weeks. I was, um, as you can tell by the books behind me, I was a bit of a stickler for, I am still a stickler for physical books. I've got loads of physical books there on my table that I, ha- I still have to um, finish and get through. But there are some books, especially some of the more let's say, uh, motivational type books that you don't necessarily need to get um, in paperback. You could probably get away with kind of listening to them on audiobook. I haven't got around to kind of listening to audiobooks on double speed. Some people kind of increase the speed so you can effectively listen to the books in a less in a shorter window of time. But I don't mind having it playing in the background whilst I'm having a shower, brushing my teeth, just doing my bits and bobs in it. So it's, it's okay in that regard. And plus, it's the, only, it's the only way to read a book and multitask at the same time. Um, obviously, some of the stuff you miss the details, some of the nuances, I, I sometimes find because you have to read a book in its physical form, you end up filling in, you end up kind of, um, I'm not sure if other people do it, but you end up kind of uh, imagining what the next chapter will be. You end up sometimes filling in the filling in the lines in between. You end up having a more vivid picture mentally about what's going on, which invariably might um, allow you to kind of um, hold on to that information for a longer period of time. Maybe, I don't know. What do you think? I think that's probably true. Probably why people kind of, you know, tend to take notes uh, vigorously when they're reading a physical book as opposed to an audio book. I've not really heard people like sitting down and making copious amounts of notes. You probably get the overall theme of a book and understand its kind of overall tenets and pieces. And maybe with an audio book, if someone, if someone kind of asks you oh, what you're reading, you could probably recite more of the book listening to an audio book as opposed to a physical copy. Because sometimes I, fi- I find that when I'm reading an actual physical copy, I tend to kind of only pick up the bits that are of relevance to me in that moment but sometimes if i'm listening to an audiobook i tend to kind of pick up on div- loads of different themes that even if they're not relevant to me even something i'm not going to implement in my own life i tend to kind of hold on to them a bit longer so i do recommend if you're a bit scared of reading books maybe at the extent i am you know, i kind of get through about four physical books a day to a month then maybe jump on the audiobook um, bandwagon i think it's a really good way to kind of get through some books at the moment like i've mentioned to you previously i'm listening to um the Edward Snowden book after his appearance on Joe Rogan, which is fucking incredible. I recommend you check that podcast out. Really cool. Joe Rogan rarely does uh, Skype interviews, but obviously in this case with, um, you know, um, with Edward Snowden being declared an enemy of the state, effectively a fugitive holed up somewhere um, randomly in Russia. Uh, they had to kind of Skype the call in, Skype the interview in, and it was really good. Um, um, probably one of the only interviews you'll see where Joe Rogan hardly talks. Uh, Edward, Edward Snowden, even though he's... Um, because I think you get a lot of these kind of developer, IT kind of, you know, hacker type, type dudes who aren't necessarily the most, um, um, what would you call it? They're not the most uh, talkative people in the world, right? Um, sometimes their interviews can be a bit hard to get through because they're essentially, you know, a little bit antisocial in that regard, a little bit introverted. But Edward Snowden came across really well. He spoke, he spoke about his story in very um, clear and honest way, in honest way, honest as he could do anyway. And if you read a book, you can kind of get a better understanding as to, you know, what kind of transpired to him uh, deciding to let the world know what exactly the CIA was doing with our information or with the information of um, residents in the United States. Um, what else have I finished lately? Have I got all oh, my finished books I've read? I'm also I've got the other books I've got listed on my um, on my books list on my app that I've got all here, as you can see here. Can, can that focus in properly? Is that focus? Focus, focus, focus. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'll read that to you. 
So I've got um, America Before by Graham Hancock. Again, you if you're familiar with um, Joe Rogan's podcast, you know that Graham Hancock always comes in there, provides some really cool and alternative takes on history and the way that we know it, and also kind of questioning some, you know, um, some common held knowledge. And this uh, American Before is a really um, divisive book in that regard. It really kind of throws out some of the theories you might have heard previously, some of the stuff you might have learned in school, so I recommend check that out. I've got Cloud Atlas just because I think someone mentioned it. I'm not sure why I've got that, but I've just mentioned, I just got it downloaded just because I listened to it. I've got the original Fight Club book by Chuck Palahniuk, um, obviously um, based, obviously where the movie was based on, which is meant to be really good. I've never really, um, I've watched the movie, of course, a few times, but I've never read the book, so I won't listen to that. I've got The Handmaid Tale, obviously, by, by Margaret uh, Atwood that I want to read first before I read the new book that she's got out because I want to get a better idea as to the whole story and see if not the TV series kind of lives up to it. But from what I've heard from all the book um, advocates out there of The Handmaid's Tale, supposedly the TV series is quite close to it, does quite a good job of relaying that vision. And obviously The Testament, I've got two, the second, the sequel in that series. And the last two, I've got Hooked. How to Build Habit Forming Products by Neil Eyal. Eyal, Eyal. He's got a really good um, lecture I listened to from the Royal School of Accounting. Or is it RSA? Wherever that channel is on YouTube, it's a channel called the RSA. And this guy called Nia Eli, spelled N-I-R-E-Y-A-L, has an incredible book called um, Hooked. And there's another one called Indistractable. Essentially, it's on the same premise of digital minimalism, you know, making sure you, you know, put your phone down, um, carving out some time to exercise to be at one with nature be alone with your thoughts read you know all that kind of wholesome stuff and lastly i've got upheaval turning points of of nations in crisis by jared diamond again just another real good in just another real good book that kind of lays the groundwork as to you know many civilizations prior to ours have risen and have fallen um these things are part of history so let's not take for granted what we have now and try our best to uh maintain this planet that we all live on so yeah those are all the books i have currently on my list i get through them easily probably within a week again a couple of hours in the morning during maybe on the way to it i try and read the book i try and listen to them in the background i probably because of all the books i've been listening to i haven't i've i've, I've missed quite a lot of podcasts i've been having to kind of just listen to bits and pieces i've got loads of um saved that i haven't really listened to so it can take a bit of time but again if you're really committed to it you can get through quite a few of them Again, I tend to kind of just, every dead air time that I have, I tend to just put on an audio book. So, you know, getting ready to go to work, on the way to work, at the station, on the train, walking to work. Um, you know, when I'm in the flow and writing something, listening into my in my headphones during my lunch break, on the way home. Every bit that I have, every kind of minute that I have kind of adds up to it. And of course, I try to carve out some dedicated time. So I have usually by about 45 minutes on the way to work, an hour at lunch, 45 minutes on the way back, which kind of equals up roughly to about an hour and a half that I have already schedules in plus all the other bits and pieces so it's quite easy to get through and again i'm not sure i'm not gonna do the double speed stuff i don't think my my time is that precious where i have to listen to everything on double speed i'm not doing that much um it's sometimes listening to it and actually meditating and actually you know really closely well you know actively listening to something as opposed to just passively listening to it is quite important too and sometimes having the person speak super fast like trisha payers or something probably doesn't help the situation but you know maybe it's just me i don't know i don't know what do i know and um, what else has been going on? That's about it, really, isn't it? Reading. But, yeah, my, my life has been pretty boring in that regard, I have to admit. It's been pretty, pretty boring. But, you know what? I love it. I love it. I'm, I'm a big fan of it. I think the older you get, the more you start to realise that boring is actually a virtue, right? Boring is actually um, very, very, very underrated. Um, the idea that you can be alone with your own thoughts, just chill, relax, you know, do the old mundane things, go on your errands, and just generally, you know, just exist and i love it i love it anyway talking about existing i've got loads of news that i've kind of saved up during a week stuff i've seen on the internet stuff that's come across to me on social media you know the general sort of stuff i'm going to run through so if you're well rested well hydrated and you've got a bit of food in your stomach sit back relax and hear me go through all the stuff that I think might be of interest and any other bits and bobs in between. Um, of course, if you're listening via the podcast app, you know how it is. Leave a five-star review at the end of the show. Let me know how you think of the show. Let me know what you think of the show by leaving a five-star review. And also, it's a good way to get people to find out about the show because podcast um, rating charts thing is a bit weird. So the only way to kind of really gauge engagement is via the reviews that people leave so people can see, oh my God, look, actually, actually talks sense. He's actually got quite, he's got some interesting opinions. I might not agree with him on some bits and pieces and he might chat shit here and there but for the most part it's an interesting show and if you're watching via the youtube app why not leave 
a little comment below why not leave me a little thumbs up and if you want to come back and check some other videos you know what that big red button on the bottom right why not click that or just underneath the video click that and subscribe so you can come back another time yeah 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 cool safe anyway let's continue on loads of stuff to talk about loads of things i want to get into but number one because you know what's more fun than watching people freak out in restaurants i don't know maybe watching liverpool coming within touching distance of winning the premiership and then losing it because they lose all their best players and then everyone realizes that they're just a mediocre team with a shouty shouty manager who reminds me of somebody that you might see at sunday league yeah nothing's more funny than that but i've got some really interesting public freak out videos that i wanted to quickly talk about just because you know i think it's an interesting um that it's, it's an interesting um case study of just how different people are you know this whole identity politics thing everyone wants to identify with their political with their with their um racial group or you know whatever everyone wants to be part of some kind of group want to fly some kind of banner everyone wants to wear like a badge in front of their t-shirt or whatever it may be right i belong to him i belong to them i am part of this group right these blanket statements but there is there, there needs to be um the more i've watched these popeye videos and there is a there was a part of me that was like you know what this popeye's thing is weirdly um a very um it seems like the optics it seems as if this is a very black thing right but then it got me thinking. I doubt. I doubt all the Popeyes beef is fairly is um, a representation of all black people in America. I'm pretty sure most black people in America or most human beings in America would look at the behavior of people. You know, re, you know, um, reducing themselves to throwing insults, throwing chairs, throwing punches, and all that sort of stuff, and sometimes stabbing people in, to death as a deplorable act for the most part. And that maybe some of the behavior we're seeing at Popeyes is maybe a reflection of the United States in general, as opposed to a reflection of a certain group of people. And then obviously when you look at where the Popeyes are located in the United States, you find that some of them are located in kind of, you know, um, economically deprived areas. Some of the areas might be uh, predominantly populated by a certain group of, by a certain population of the country or a certain population of the world or a certain backgrounds or a current creed. You know, so when you start to get into the minutiae of the details, you start to realize, okay, it's not a black problem, it's an American problem. But then it got me thinking as well, just why is it, just forget the Popeyes thing, just forget, you know, it being a black issue, just, just, just think about it as like a societal thing. Why is it in America, people that go to fast food restaurants to go and order, you know, some kind of fast food goodness whether it's be something that's covered in breadcrumbs or something that's um you know uh what you call, what's that thing called um braised on both sides on a flat iron whatever it may be called on a plancha whatever they do right they order burgers they love things that are deep fried why is it when people go there and they don't get the order they want or they get an order that's a bit wrong or the attendant isn't as attentive as they want them to be or they get the wrong change? Why does it always devolve into a shouting match or an argument or a war? That's what the thing I never understood. And part of me thinking about it yesterday, I was meditating on this. I was like, you know what? Do you think part all this behavior is part is an is um is an unintended consequences of them having a tip culture and service industry as opposed to having a minimum wage, right? Because United States, most English people, most Europeans will know that when you go to the United States, you have that bit, of, you have that culture, culture shock when you go to a bar or restaurant and you order your food, you pay your money and you leave, and they tell you, "Hey, you're not gonna fucking tip or something." Right? You get shouted at, like I did when I first went to New York in 2007 or wherever it was. Right? I went to this really cool bar. Um, it was, I think, in a hotel somewhere or somewhere really weird next to a university. I'm not sure what it was called. Anyone from the United States, let me know, or from New York specifically, fill in the blanks. But I remember there was this restaurant bar place that was basically serving, that was giving you a free pizza of every beer you ordered. And I'm pretty sure it was just full of students, like NYU students and shit. And um, so the, the free pizza was basically a seven inch cheese and tomato pizza that they made fresh in the back, right? The guy was basically, you know, kneading the dough and all that sort of stuff. And then every topping you got on top was obviously a bit extra. And obviously the beers were, um, the prices were risen a bit. So I think it was maybe like, you know, um, to, to basically make it level. So essentially the beers might have been five to six dollars or some shit, right? Not the best beer, but you know, good enough. And I remember, you know, ordering a few drinks, ordering a few pizzas, and then, um, especially obviously between the, the uh, all of us that were there, about 15 boys that went over from London, and then halfway through our order, halfway through our night, one of the bartenders kind of, you know, um, got a little bit snarky, a bit rude in me, and, and essentially told me, you guys should tip in it. So then I realized quite quickly, oh, there's a tipping culture, and obviously he was nice enough after he kind of settled down to tell me, oh, how much you meant to tip, blah, 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 blah. So I went through that process. But I think in the other day, maybe it's because they have a tip culture where essentially the service industry, the people that work in the service industry are relying on tips to, um, are relying on tips in order to make up the difference of their poor 
kind of entry level salary so they get paid low by the hour so maybe two three dollars and then the tips essentially kind of take them up to the you know standard minimum wage of like seven to ten dollars or whatever maybe or sometimes fifteen dollars depending on what state you're in that might be a, the case of it the reason why i say that is because once a customer has once a customer knows that the tip is uh, this powerful sign of approval that you've done a good job as a server it weirdly enough puts the power in the hands of the customer so that the server or the waitress or the waiter front of house sous chef whatever it may be is really under pressure and really has to make sure that they're shucking and diet shucking and dancing in order to make sure that the customer's happy enough so that they don't leave a bad review on yelp don't bad mouth you on facebook and don't you know publicly drag you on twitter or something that might be part of the reason why like it's an unintended consequence because you have this tip culture customers get entitled and when they get entitled they expect five star service or that's the thing that really freaks me out and i think the tip culture is the thing because i think all this shouty shouty shit you i think even though people make it seem as if you know this is just all everyone that's poor and black but i think it's a societal thing i think if you if someone showed you i'm pretty sure you find loads of videos of private members clubs of people kind of throwing a hissy fit because they didn't get their fucking you know prosecco delivered to their table on time i'm pretty sure it's the same thing because the tip culture because they know essentially that they hold the keys to your i don't know financial security or um your mood overall right i'm sure if you work in a service industry and someone tips you quite a large tip or leaves you a large tip it can effectively you know make your night which then can lead into kind of having a good week or whatever it may be um so they have that kind of power in them and i think that's what kind of drives them to all this kind of nutty behavior because i saw this video again another video this this is a titled white boomer uh man freaks out and he has our staff because he wants his popeyes tendies and it's just the unnecessary rudeness of the video it's like bloody hell you hear in the background listen to the podcast but you can watch it here from the, in the background just listen to how much of a no. cunt this guy is chicken tenders right look well, how look how he's actually fucking tenders then <laughs> Take my fucking credit card then! <laughs> you have two choices! <laughs> Give me the fucking tender then! <laughs> Don't you really find it funny when white people do that whole like Take shouty it. thing? Like that's gonna get you scared. What is that about? Like there, there, there is a particular way of shouting that white people do when they go like, hey, bah, 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 bah. Like, what's that's not gonna do nothing. I'm not scared of your you raising your voice. Like, if any if if any if there's any if there's been any benefit from the social media age is that we've now been all, we're all accustomed to hearing that screech in the background when someone's fighting you know when it's two people fighting and there's a girl like stop stop it ah, ah. that that fucking shit in the background no one gets scared anymore you don't really it's not annoying anymore when you hear people screeching or shouting or a stampede during black friday and shit so when people raise their voice in this manner do you honestly think i'm gonna be scared and worried about you raising your voice in your fucking waterproof architect's jacket and your stupid sweatpants and your running shoes do you really think i care like i don't get that shouting thing it's so bizarre especially in the service industry job the person behind the cashier has seen enough whack jobs in their lives to know that you're not gonna do nothing you still want your chicken tenders you're not gonna hit me you're not gonna do anything i mean you're not about this life really you're just shouting for the sake of shouting it's very very strange give me the fucking tender look these two lovely ladies behind just looking at this guy like why is this guy shouting and he's still shouting yeah. still wants your chicken tenders does he get them in give the end your fucking manager, <laughs> now he wants his manager at first he said there were two choices now there's a third choice because he wants his manager. Give me my credit card back or give me... Like, what in the fuck is God? And again, let's just try and parse out the scenario here. What could have possibly led this guy to shout this hard? He probably got there, went to all these chicken tenders. They were taking too long. Um, okay, cool. Don't Can't you just um, alert one of the staff and say, hey, I've, I've been here waiting here for 10 minutes. Could you check um, if my chicken tenders are anywhere near ready or give me an indication as to when I'm going to receive them? One. Or if you're a grown up, right, and you've got any dignity about it, you just wait until maybe I don't know. I like to wait until maybe one one person or two and a half people have ordered in front of me, or one and a half. Let's say one person's got it ordered and got their order in their hand, and one person is now ordered, and the person and the, the staff is behind the what do you call it in the kitchen making it. That's when I might pipe up. But I'm not gonna pipe up after ten minutes. You don't know what's going on. They might be making your thing. I don't know if stuff happens in it like just just wait and chill out if there's anything we know about fast food restaurants that for the most part they're quite fast right you're you're very unlikely to spend two hours in a place like this in a place like popeyes especially it's not you know it's not some fancy hipster burger restaurant where you got a queue outside it's just popeyes you know they're gonna give you your tenders at the end but again it just keeps going what happens in the end does he get his tenders see so he got his tenders 
And what, what do you say? They say sorry or nothing? No, he got his tenders like a little baby and his little drink, and now he heads off. So imagine eating your chicken tenders angry. Imagine eating those lovely, uh, buttery soft, breaded um, strips of, you know, probably GMO chicken in your car. Because you know he's the kind of type that's going to eat that shit in his car. Sad, listening to fucking some, you know, Glenn Greenwald shit in the background. You know that's going to happen. Um, but yeah, man, what a mad guy. What a ma- And again, I, I just think it's something you don't, you don't really see too often in, in the UK. Especially with the boss mans, right? The boss mans are quite, you know... A boss man in London will give you, will give as good as they take for the most part. They, you know, you might be able to beat them up, but they're not going to stand, they're not going to stand back down. You can't chat shit to a boss man. And for the most part, someone in a restaurant too will tell you to shut the fuck up. So you don't really get a lot of that um, uh, friction in chicken shops, especially in London or in the UK. I don't think so. Sometimes the friction comes from just the patrons themselves, the customers. They might be opposing gangs or just people that just, you know, bump into each other or someone jumps the line. You know, people like that, that can happen, but... You're not going to get you arguing with a boss man, bro. He'll, he'll, he'll dash the spatula out of your face. You know what I mean? He will literally throw a cup of burning hot oil in you. Or, I don't know, chuck this little chassage of fucking, you know, ketchup all over your neck and shit. You know, cut your, you know, little serrated edges. Slit your neck with it as well. But yeah, it's a, it's a very particular American thing. Again, I have no real solution for it as a part. Maybe I just think if they abolish tipping... And they just raised everyone's minimum salary. I think it would get rid of all this shouty shouty shit because these customers are way too entitled. You can't go into a Popeyes and just berate the cashiers like this because you haven't received your chicken tenders in 0.1 seconds. So like, relax. Just relax. It's a bizarre, bizarre world we live in. But, you know, what can you do? And then, large, lastly, or largely, lastly, we've got another one. And this guy says, man argues when he doesn't get his food. I think this is McDonald's. <laughs> I love how he's like. There's a guy in McDonald's right shouting. I'll describe it to him. He's shouting and berating the people at the back or the back in the, on the cashier, and he's doing that bad man thing where he's rocking back and forward, pulling up his trousers like as if something's gonna happen. Relax. No need to pull up your trousers. No need to take off your rings. No need to take off your jacket. Just chill. Chill. Just chill. Literally, it's McDonald's. Because if there's one place where you're gonna receive your food in time, it's gonna be McDonald's, right? It's, it's, a, it's a fucking, you know, fucking line factory of burgers, right? They're gonna eventually get to your order. Just relax. And I, I don't think I've ever been to a McDonald's where I've missed an item, gone back, and I have not got it. They've always been, oh, I project, no worries, I'll go and get that thing for you. Show me a receipt, or sometimes you don't even need a receipt. If it's busy, just say, look, just take your t- tenders and keep it moving. Take your burger, Big Mac, and to keep it moving. So to, you know, to reduce yourself to this kind of like back rocking back and forth, like, yeah, man, what the fuck, man, what's my, what, what's my Burger King, or my Big Mac at, sorry, Big Mac, come on, really? I love that, that you're going to get it when I give it to you, I love that, that is essentially it, isn't it, where's my burger, when it's ready, you'll get it, <laughs> that's the perfect response, when it's ready, you'll get it, is that, okay, cool. See? What else can you say though? Well, it's ready, you'll get it, innit? Shut the fuck up. Hey, I love it. I love it. What you want to do? You, you want to stand here and argue or stay like a human and wait or argue? I love it. And then straight after you hear top of the back, 495. I love it. I love it. Just call it. That's what you need to do. Call them out on their bullshit. Like, what are you going to do? Are you going to literally jump over this counter and hit me? Because you haven't received your burger, your burger in five seconds, or are you gonna stay classy and just chill and wait? If not, get the fuck out. You know what I mean? We don't need this hassle. And I guess you, because sometimes you remember in the beginning when they had Mac, when they had McDonald's security staff at Liverpool Street Station. I used to think, fucking hell, man, this is ridiculous. Why you need these people at this McDonald's? Is making any sense? And then, because I don't usually go out that much around Shoreditch anymore, so I don't necessarily have to come back that way to get my train to go home. But one day I did. And I happened to pass by, and I happened to go into the McDonald's to get a couple of burgers before I went home. And I was like, okay, they need security guards in here. Because that McDonald's at Liverpool City Station is wild. It's wild. Friday, from probably Thursday to Saturday night, it's maybe one of the worst places I've seen in terms of human interactions, especially between, you know, customers and employees, and between security guards and customers, and just in generally between humans and humans. Like... Everyone there is at varying levels of intoxication, varying levels of drug abuse, varying levels of temperament, varying levels of, of income, varying levels of um, entitlement. Just the worst petri, petri dish of humanity, especially the British humanity, you could serve up. It's just insane 
how wild it is in there. People jumping queues, having fights, girls with no shoes on, walking around McDonald's, bare feet, all white, by the way. White girls love walking around bare feet. Um, just the most ridiculous shit you just see in your life. Like guys wearing skinny jeans and tight shirts, um, munching on a burger, making each other laugh with their stupid lad humor. Girls repeating the same story 10 times. Yeah, then I told him, yeah, where's he going? I, I took him away from me, I saw him, you away. Shut the fuck up. You just want to stuff that double cheeseburger down her throat. It's just mama mia. It's the worst. And then I realized, you know what? You don't need security guards. So maybe, because you don't really see that much security in these um fast food restaurants in the States. It's probably a, it's a, it's a real European thing then, right? I don't see any security guards. Not ever. There's a, so many fights you see in these restaurants <coughs> where essentially no one's breaking it up you know having a fight in a restaurant isn't the best place to kind of break up a fight because by and large everyone in there is hungry right everyone in there wants to put their feet up enjoy their burger and just keep it moving and by and large as well i've been i've brought up i've been brought up in a mantra of like you know mind your own business if there's got a fight and they've got reason to fight well, who am i to break up a honest hearty um well-deserved fight between two men or two women, or sometimes between a man and a woman, which can get a bit wild. They might have to break it up. They might have some actual differences that they might just settle out in the middle of a fucking McDonald's at 12 p.m. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Oh, man. Absolutely nuts, man. Big up America. The gift that keeps on giving. Okay. Let's move on because that stuff is done, right? So, I want to quickly talk about uh, um, Mike Riley and VAR. Just because, you know, it's not essentially a football thing, but more so just a a weird societal thing, a weird kind of snobbery thing. But if you're familiar with football, you know that VAR um, has come in, in effect, which is essentially um, a system that's meant to aid referees in decision making. It's meant to cut out all the errors, right? So if if referee has any doubt of a decision they made, they can go to a virtual um assistant referee you yeah, know essentially um that's how somewhere way 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 outside of the stadium somewhere i think in dover or whatever maybe so there's ob- objectivity in that regard so you're not influenced or swayed by the noise and the atmosphere of the stadium um the referee panel in that room reviews the video and if they deem it if they deem it to be an error you know the referee can then decide whether or not to overall no sorry if they deem it to be an error they can correct the decision right and the idea is that sometimes in professional sports especially the highest level um there is it's, it's a game of fine margins right so if you've got a team two teams with you know the the same amount of resources the same amount of income maybe prestige levels there's only so much they, there's only so many good players you can buy at one time right so only so many good managers out there so it does become a game of fine margins like who can keep their team fit who can avoid injuries avoid suspensions whose team's on form who can keep a consecutive run going loads of really smart minute things right but then there's factors outside of it have nothing to do with you like officiating right sometimes there's a decision one decision especially if you imagine there's a game where a team's losing 2-1 and just before half time the losing team should should have got a free kick just outside the area but a free kick doesn't get given then straight away after that incident the free kick doesn't give them which everyone thinks is a free kick the other team that's winning wins scores another goal before half time to make it 3-1 They've now got a two-goal lead, and it's essentially changed the entire nature of the of the game. Because if that team would have gone into that game into into, into halftime two-one, the team that was losing, and got the free kick, they might have potentially leveled the um, the game before halftime, right, with a goal from the free kick, or they might have had a close chance that would have invigorated them as they went into their change room at halftime. They would have come out second half all guns blazing. So referee decisions have a lot um, have a lot of weight to them in terms of. Um, dictating the overall flow of the game and now unfortunately i don't know why it's about football maybe because in general because you know i don't know what it is about football but there's a thing about football where the officials are have kind of placed themselves front and center of the drama of, of, of football maybe because of the chaotic nature of it and so people running around you but foot referees have become part of the game where they're meant to be just you know in the background officiating they've also become a fixture where people kind of aim hate at them they're not very much well respected and I think what happens with VAR is which something that I never thought would be something that I thought something that I still think now a lot of people a lot of people are not really admitting. But I think what VAR has done is it's exposed the level of referees we have in the Premier League. It's shown that even with video assistant referees, that what it's basically showed is that our referees don't know what the fuck they're doing. They're incompetent. And for the most part, even if they get it wrong, they'd rather be wrong and right than right and wrong. 
right? They don't, they don't want to reverse the decision and kind of damage their ego or kind of lose any stock or value. So they'd rather just stick firm and tight with their wrong opinion and just keep it moving because they know, you know, by and large, they don't really have to answer to no one. They don't come out and give interviews. Um, th- they're quite insular in that regard and don't really take criticism too well, it seems, for the most part. And it's quite frustrating because, again, there's so much money in football. There's so much at stake, you know, especially when you look at, forget the teams at the top who might win stuff. Look at the people below, like the um, you know the people in the relegation zone and stuff. How they're suffering from poor decisions, especially when they're facing some of the bigger teams, or especially if they're in those kind of relegation six pointers, and the referee decides to have a shitty game or doesn't give the right decision. It can affect a lot of your kind of overall season, and it can sometimes build uh, a complex in your head where you think you know these officials, referees, are out to get you, which can then maybe affect the way you kind of approach games. It could that, that couldn't even be true. Imagine it's not even true. Imagine it's not even a thing. But you might actually start realizing and start believing in the conspiracy theories. It might affect the way you go into games. That's a really bizarre thing that I've never really understood. And then one of the part of the things that's really interesting or really weird is that I think from all the big leagues out there that use VAR, the English Premier League is the only one that doesn't allow referees to go and rewatch the footage on the monitor just to the side of the pitch. And most leagues have it. So if a referee makes a mistake or isn't sure about decision, they can quickly go to the monitor on the side of the pitch and figure it out. What they have in the English Premier League is that they have the officials that have housed in another room somewhere in the middle of Kent reviewing it silently in the background or like and then kind of communicating their information back to the referee via his earpiece. And it takes ages to go and do. So it's like, what's the point? Why don't just have him review the footage on the screen while it's there? That's the best thing to do, right? I've never really understood why they don't do that. It's a very bizarre way to go about things. Um so, but then now they're going to change it. Uh, VAR, this is an article I got from BBC. It says, referee's chief Mike Riley is to tell officials to use pitch size TV monitors. And the article says the following, uh, Premier League officials are to be encouraged to make use of the pitch size VA monitors. Referee's chief Mike Riley is expected to tell clubs later this week. All 20 top five clubs we represented at the meeting with Riley Central London on Thursday. Top of the agenda will be the ongoing controversies around VAR, which continued at Saturday when Sheffield United had a goal ruled out at Tottenham because of their marginal offside altercation, which is crazy. Basically, his big toes offside. Riley will be quizzed about the various VI issues, including inconsistencies in decision making and the time it takes for rulings to be made, which in some instances have been several minutes after goals are scored, which can pretty really deflate every any atmosphere in the other stadium, right? Um, it's acknowledged that solutions are not straightforward. However, it is anticipated Riley will tell the clubs the on referee will make more use of the monitors. It was envisioned that th- that would happen from the point referee Riley came into the Premier League, but Riley advised referees not to use them in order to p- prevent additional delays. That's insane, really, because there's more delays on the ref. Because again, that it shows that I think VIA was also proved that officials' rules are quite subjective. People don't like to say it, but they are. Some, you know, that kind of stupid rule where if a foul happens outside the box, it's a free kick. It happens inside the box and it's soft. I never really understood a foul is a foul. But sometimes, you know, the rules get bent here and there depending on the game. Especially the high profile, high stakes level games. The ones that have a lot of, you know, um, sway in the Premier League in terms of the global audience that I've shown in China, all over the place. They tend to not send anyone off there because they don't want to, you know, ruin a game in that regard. But, you know, I don't want that. I want the referee to officiate the game in, in some respects. And in general... Decisions are quite subjective, right? You just go to a pub and after a controversial decision has been made and asks five people their opinion on it and you're going to get five different opinions, you know? It's subjective. But what you want to see is the referee... Is essentially, you want to see the referee be able to look at the screen, check to see if that was actually a handball on offside, and if they decide to change their mind or decide to stick with the decision, then you can directly lay the blame at the referee's feet and not look for all these other scapegoats. That's the thing that Mike Riley's fucking up on. It's not, you know what I mean? It's like, you'd make it a much easier job for yourself if you just let them essentially hang themselves with their own rope, right? If they looked at this TV screen and still decided not to go with the right decision, then you can say, okay, this referee is absolutely dog shit. But the fact that they have to listen to an earpiece of someone that's not there, watch a fucking video and then relay that back to them is bizarre. <clears throat> Especially when no one knows what the fuck's going on. It's such a weird kind of um, method. And again, just just the backward nature of the English Premier League in general. Again, I don't have any real um, solutions. For, well, the solution I have for it is that referees should look at the monitors, but I'm not sure if this is going to be implemented because, again, I think the referees union um, or the referee officials in general are quite egotistical and they want to believe that they can actually make most of the correct decisions most of the time which obviously isn't true especially if you see some of them see some of the matches from the last couple of weeks it's been atrocious decisions you've kind of seen go on but you know again things these things could change but 
I think VAR isn't the issue. The issue is the referees. We've known that for a while. And now they're trying to change the goal and trying to change the, the direction or trying to change the virtual tools of VAR. So the VAR system is fine. It might be a bit pixelated. The lines look a bit weird. But for the most part, all we want is referees to be able to see a replay of the incident. If they make a decision via various angles that it's the right decision they made in the first place, okay, cool. Go with it. But the fact that this idea that they shouldn't watch the videos to, to, for delay is really, really odd. But again, what do I know? Anyway, moving on. What else do we have here? We have... Fold is back, by the way. Fold is back. The premier nightclub in east london one of my favorite places to go to and a place i've covered on here quite often i think i've got various videos about fold i think you guys are very aware or um cognitive of the the the, the love i have for that little establishment in canning town they ran into some issues last week um it was announced quite abruptly that they had to close due to a, a criminal investigation behind some of the people involved in fold concerning money laundering um, concerning some of the capital that they used to essentially buy the place or lease the place might have come from some uh, dodgy places that's all alleged now at the moment um, the people involved in it are fighting their case fold seemingly are standing by the people and saying this isn't necessarily true and I think in general um, it's good to hear because what we've seen via the details of the case especially some of the stuff that's transpired now especially with the case details and some of the meeting notes is that we've seen that even though some of the comments I've made previously, you still, I still stand by them in terms of, you know, being a bit more careful about the people that you're involved in your business dealings when it comes to launching these places and these clubs because effectively London authorities or local councils are looking for any excuse to shut these places down as we've seen, you know, through the kind of, you know, uh, the random bodies strewn on the floor in terms of clubs that have kind of closed in the last 10 years or so, right? It's been, it's been nuts. I think it's in a double figure, maybe triple figures of nightclubs and bars that have closed all across the UK that have been kind of, you know, influential and really important places for the culture. So they want any excuse to get rid of a club, they'll they'll use it. So any club, any prospective club owner, anyone that wants to open a place needs to be very careful about how they do it, how they go about it. There has to be a very, there has to be a, a continued dialogue between yourself and the local council. You know, you have to kind of, you know, scope the local community, get their opinion, get them involved, give everyone a heads up, you know, the usual stuff and really make it um, known that you are launching this place in order to be an asset to the local community, not to be a hindrance. And only then, only then, through kind of successful, you know, running of your nights and making sure no one throws up outside or kicks a fucking door down or makes a certain noise, only then will you be left alone. But if you do anything else, they're going to come knocking. And this is an example of it. So I hope now this is a, a kind of, no, wake wake up call in some respects to fold and to also the people that are going to go to fold and people who are going to open other folds that this place, I think, is re it, it, the reaction from it on social media goes to show just how we are lacking in good establishments because as as much as i love fold and i think it's amazing it should be the norm a, a place like fold should exist in every area of london north east southwest or north southwest right it should exist we should have a fold everywhere we should have one place we can go to and go and rave up up until 6 a.m with good security with great security guards nice bartenders great sound system and a, and a bevy of international world-renowned djs that are going to come and duppy the place right that's what we should have everyone should have that place we've done so the reaction we saw with Fold Online, the change petition out there, it goes to show just how lacking we are in these establishments. But it's also our responsibility as punters, as customers to go into these places and respect them. Don't fuck them up. Don't give the council, don't give the local authorities any excuse to shut these places down. Because if we do give them an excuse, they will shut it down with fucking glee. They'll be happy to close the doors. Happy, more than happy. And again, it will it will be they'll be cutting up their nose to spite their face, right? The local the local community will suffer because I'm pretty sure McDonald's, the kebab shop, the breakfast spot, the Morrisons, the Iceland's, not the Morrisons, the co-op, the the 24 hour off license around the corner. I'm sure all those places will tell you that Fold has been a net positive for them. They've probably seen an increase in the amount of monies that they're kind of gaining, especially the last party. Do you see last one? Fold put on, they put like 30 hour, 31 hour fucking party on for a 10th birthday party of some label, right? That went on just as they opened. Come on, man. It's good news all around. So again, don't let's not give them any excuse. So um, I'm happy to see it's back open. Here's a little article from Resident Advisor that details the whole um, ordeal. Um, it says the following: London Club Fold allowed to reopen by Newham Council during a fraud investigation. Um, this is from Resident Advisor. 
the suspension of the club's license was lifted in the hearing at New Ram Town Hall this morning, which is fucking awesome to hear. After being forced to close, Fold is operating his operating license. When its operating license was suspended on Monday, the Canton venue has been granted permission to open in an, an ex- expedited hearing with New Ram Council at the Town Hall on Friday morning. The lift of suspension comes with conditions regarding the two people, Lasha, um, who's also involved in Fold. And is a license holder and a person currently unnamed in public documents who Metropolitan Police have arrested on suspicion. Neither person has been charged with, and both have been released on police custody. And um, the Lasher person is on bail and the unnamed person without. The council ruled that they shall be excluded from attending the premises so they're banned completely from going to fold at all times and ex- excluded from being involved in day-to-day management of the company, operational duties of the premises at all times. While the full investigation is ongoing. These will be the. This will be the full license. There will be a full license review future in the hearing. Oh my! My reading is so bad. I'm so sorry. There will be a full license review hearing at a future date pending the police and national crime agency investigation. Shortly after the hearing, followed posted a statement on Instagram, and this is the this is the statement. I love the picture. The picture is fucking awesome. You know what I don't like about Fold a little bit. I have to be honest. Something I think they might have to change. When you go there, they tell you no pictures, right? And it's very much in the vein of you know. The, the clubs that we all know and love in Berlin and stuff, right? So the idea is that you are essentially trying to create a safe space for those involved, people that want to go in and just let their hair down and not have the, you know, the added weight or the added self-consciousness of people having their phones out and recording. So just go in there, let their head, let their head down, have a dance and go home and enjoy themselves, which is cool. I love it. Number one thing that they do quite poorly there is that the stickers they use for your phone are fucking shit. They have these stickers that, they use for... I think they used them during Junction 2 Festival. So last time I went, they had Junction 2 Festival stickers that were essentially coming off every single minute. They were really shit stickers that didn't really stick too well. Now, right, stickers don't stick too well and they fall off your phone. Number two problem I have with it, they use quite a lot of f- pictures, mobile phone pictures or pictures in general, from inside the club on their social media to promote their events. So they say no pictures are allowed, but then they keep putting videos of nights from the thing out on their Instagram or pictures on their Facebook, which kind of sends out mixed signals. So then it makes the punter think, hmm, should I use my phone or should I not use my phone? So I think that's one thing they have to maybe review in their marketing promotion material. If I was going to advise them, if I was in charge of their marketing, I would make sure I wouldn't use any f- footage from inside fold of my phone. I would essentially clean the entire interwebs or especially my feed of any images concerning the inside of the club, my Facebook, all that stuff, and essentially just kind of you know, allow the mistakes to carry on because now Fold has got this name, it's got its reputation, everyone's speaking about it on the streets and shit. All the events are have essentially upwards to about upwards of fifty people on Resident Advisor confirmed attending and going up, right? It's insane. Every weekend people are going and having a good time. You don't need to kind of sell it anymore, really. It's kind of it's kind of now it's in the now it's kind of gaining momentum, especially with the reaction you've seen since it got suspended or the license got suspended. You've seen that there's a momentum behind it. You don't need to keep selling the inside. Just kind of leave it a bit mysterious, a little bit of mystique, you know? So when people actually go in there, they're like, ah, oh, now I get why this place is fucking amazing. As opposed to just showing everything and anything that's in there. There's no surprise anymore, isn't it? Um, but anyway, here's a statement from Fold concerning the whole license being lifted thing. Um, Fold says the following. Fold is proud to confirm that the licensing suspension has been lifted with a full license hearing to be scheduled in the coming weeks. In the meantime, our schedule will be resumed as planned. Boom. So I'm going to go to Intervisions. Happy, happy, happy. I'm going to Intervisions. So big up everyone that's going to Intervisions and was afraid it was not going to happen. We are going. Um, with we have fold denied any accusation of wrongdoing or improperly or impropriety against us or any individual employees and are assisting the police ongoing investigation. We could we could not have achieved this without our ongoing support and the actions of our community in the last 36 hours which was really cool. We have proven once again that together we can stand strong in the face of adversity. We would like to thank every single one of you that has supported us in this difficult period. All our all your efforts and messages have meant the world to us. Our activities will return to immediate effect with the same passion and the same love. Fold are confident the police will conclude that Ford have not acted improperly, um, failing which Ford will fight until the truth is revealed. See you on the dance floor. Those open at 11 p.m. for our team. And also, you know, into this is a cool message. There's also something to be heard, said for if, if ever there was a time to support a club, especially if you want to keep it open, especially with this ongoing case, they're going to need all the help they can, especially with, you know, um, lawyer fees and all that sort of stuff. So they're going to need people to attend the club, you know, again, make it some money, buy some drinks, all that sort of shit. So go there, buy tickets, attend the events, support the club, support them in their fight. And hopefully there's good news at the end of it when the verdict comes through and they haven't done any wrongdoing. But if they have done some wrongdoing, lessons can still be learned from the club that comes after 
for the close because one thing we do know as heartbreaking it is for some of our establishments to close down there's always another thing that kind of pops up right i don't think when we lost plastic people anyone could ever envisage that we're gonna have this club open in the middle of canning town i wouldn't even have imagined a club like a club in canning town would attract the many people that it has done over the years right or over the last couple of years it's been open it's insane how how big it's got over time but yeah i'm, I'm happy to see them successful happy to see this happening happy to see the suspension get lifted i'm also happy that new m council kind of you know was able to see sense and see the value um that um fold has to the local community and hopefully everyone in there can also abide by the rules and make the place a success going forward but yeah check that news out fold is still continuing loads of events happening the following this following weekend so again check them out on resident advisor and support them when and if you can my friends next on the list here we have Berghain 15th anniversary birthday party which is good news for those of you that live in berlin and good news for those of you who are obsessed with berlin like i am um this is news from Resident Advisor. It says Berlin is throwing a 15th anniversary birthday party. I wish I could go. I honestly wish I could go. Again, maybe it's too soon because I've already been, what, end of October. Um, it's now the, approaching the end of November. Maybe a bit too soon to go, but that would be so cool just to go and hang out there for the 15th birthday party. I think it's from Monday to, no, is it from Saturday to Monday or whatever? So that would be fucking cool and then come straight back in and out. I really went through that. It's just one of my um plans or goals is to kind of do one of those nights where you leave you essentially take one day off you take the monday off and you leave um london saturday morning the first flight out from stansted or wherever it may be you get to berlin for about 10 or 11 um you put your stuff down in airbnb and then you kind of go have some food whatever it may be and then go party all the way until monday come back and then go back to work on tuesday or do that thing where you leave on friday night don't get any accommodation and go straight to the the clubs, rave and party, and then get accommodation for the Saturday, Sunday, Monday. So you essentially save one night of accommodation, which might be a good way to go about stuff, isn't it? Because essentially that first night, especially if you go after work, you're going to arrive there by, what, 9 or 11 p.m.? It's like two hours. I mean, you're, you're paying a full night a full night stay in the hostel or an Airbnb for, what, three hours? It's not really worth it, isn't it? You might as well just go out and just stay out all night um, and then get your place and then kind of you know uh, meet your host in the morning once you kind of stagger out of a nightclub or whatever maybe um or you end up falling asleep in burger like i did a couple of times but you know story for another day so this is an article from resident advisor they're throwing a 15th anniversary birthday party in Berghain. it says the berlin club will host surgeon Catherine barbia uh katrina barbia sorry and and more across three rooms with the doors opening on saturday 4th of december Berghain has revealed the plans for a 15th anniversary party um uh, we'll start just be was it the foot foot zin foot sign ja bergheim will start just before midnight on saturday december the 14th running through until sometime in monday 24 acts have been tapped uh with bergheim slots for the likes of surge guy surgeon sorry aurora hala uh marcel deepman of course dj pete uh neon chambers aka Kanding ray and siga who will perform live the panorama bar with similarly stacked residents and regulars including steffi one of my favorites nick hoopin of course tamas soma um and in book micah boris the third room higher which is rarely open will feature sets from Catherine Barbia, Grand River, Tobias, and plus DJ sets from Alexandra and Fido. So here's a so that's a pretty stacked lineup. I'm pretty sure some of you guys are super pumped for it as I am. The actual full list is on here, isn't it? Right? An actual events page. It's insane. So they've got everyone listed here. They've got Bergheim, they've got Panorama Bar, and they've got the Saloon. They've got Soundstream playing live. But um, they always say Soundstream is live. But when I've seen him play at Panorama Bar, it's always just be using decks. What they mean by live? Does it mean he's got like a little MIDI player or a sampler or an 808s next to him as he's playing? Whenever I've seen Soundstream play, I've seen Soundstream maybe four times at the Bergheim. No, at Panorama Bar specifically. And he's always just behind some decks. I don't really get the whole like live thing there. But, you know, maybe I'm uh, missing something. Uh, Panorama Bar, so far they've got soundstream boris uh dinky fort ramu Ma matthew styles nick cooper steffi and tamasoma of course but yeah proper quality lineup um again a an event i would love to go to it's probably a bit too soon to try and save up money to go there at the moment but again if i was um financially able and had the time because i think you well going just in december before christmas and buying everyone's gifts it's like you feel a bit bad isn't it i should be saving money to buy some gifts for my family so i shouldn't really be doing this so i'm gonna i'm gonna leave it for now but for those of you that are interested definitely check it out uh berlin at 15th anniversary december 14th to the monday the 16th you know consecutive hours are just full-on party time so definitely check it out definitely check it out if you're obsessed with the burger and like i am
Next on the list, what else we have? Oh, Motorola Razor. Are you guys fun? Are you guys fun? Do you guys like Motorola? Do you guys want to be a Motorola fanboy? I'm a fan of Motorola. This is pretty cool, right? So this came out of nowhere. I wasn't really expecting. No, actually, the rumors circulated a few weeks ago that this was gonna come back out again. Oops, let me pause that. Screen. So what that? So rumors did come. Was it a couple of weeks ago? We heard the rumors. Was it a couple of weeks ago? Or maybe a few weeks ago. I heard rumors that um, Motorola were going to re-release the Razer, but I never. I just heard it was just a, a kind of. Um, it was going to be a minimalist phone. I think that was the kind of um, idea behind it. They were going to basically capitalize on this trend where people want to um, not be tethered to their phone so much and they want to have a phone that essentially does the bare minimum. You can use WhatsApp. You can send SMSs. Um, you can maybe browse the internet, you know, on like a base level. But that's about it. It's just essentially calling, receiving messages, and that's it, right? So that's the rumor that I heard. But now we have some pictures and some reviews of the Motorola Razr. And essentially what they've done is that they've uh, really taken the um, foldable uh, smartphone model to the next level. I know we've got that Google Fold that folds basically that way like a book. But I think this clamshell um, version of, fold, of folding a phone is going to be maybe the one that a lot of people are going to be interested in. Because I think there is a need now especially if you've seen the form factor of the new iphones and the size of them it feels as if nowadays a lot of consumers don't really want to have the massive ipad -y type iphone xl phone in their pocket people want to have if you can there's maybe a return back to smaller phones because that was a that was a thing that happened during the whole peak era of nokia's remember nokia's when they were out every every year nokia and, Eric and sony x especially were competing to have the smallest basically form factor of a phone and the smaller the phone, the more expensive it was for the most part, right? That's essentially, well, I think the 8210 or the 8310 was one of the most expensive phones I had during the time that I was in school. And it just kept every every phone subsequently from that kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? They went to basically make the form factor smaller so people can just put pop them in their phone and, you know, whatever it may be. Then from somehow, I think maybe the introduction of Palm Pilots and maybe two ways and shit the form factor kind of switched back again to giant phones i remember when i had my motorola i had my first free phone my, yeah when free first launched they had this uh motorola that i had that was fucking massive right it was like literally like a remote control and it didn't stop getting bigger since then you've kind of removed the buttons and you know now we've got massive kind of screen that essentially you can tap and kind of you know do some force tapping and some interesting stuff on and now it seems as if with the Motorola Razr, because I think these things are never in isolation. They're always kind of a response to kind of what's happening in normal life. Even though more people are, I've seen more people, more than ever, people are wearing those little side bags and pouches. It feels as if now we're going to go to a turn where people don't really want to leave the house with a fucking bag hanging, you know, across their body. They just want to be able to kind of put a phone in their pocket and just keep it moving. And maybe the addition, introduction of these kind of foldable phones might be the way to kind of solve this. And I think this Motorola Razr, this Motorola Razr, this new version, anyway, has probably been my most favorite way of kind of um, using the foldable screen technology. I'm not sure how they did. I'm not sure how they achieved it, especially the hinge. The phone, essentially, it can be completely flat once it's kind of been folded out. Um, the hinge is a very ingenious way. They've kind of made that work. And just in general, the idea that um, the camera isn't that great, I think, for the videos I've seen of MKHB is talking about it. Um, but it just works as a phone. It's a basic, And this is a picture I've got here from Verge. Um, they've got a really big, amazing video here in the background you can check out, which I'm going to mute because I don't want to get demonetized and shit. But yeah, essentially, it's a massive phone from Razer, from Motorola Razr, a massive kind of foldable phone that kind of folds up into a clam, which I'm really keen on. I think just because for the reason um, I would like to have a phone, I would like to have a phone that I'm not tethered to all the time. And I think the addition of it being foldable might mean that I'm not looking at it too often. Or even though I remember when people did have razors back in my school, everyone used to like to make that sound of it kind of opening and closing. That clap, that snap sound was something people always wanted to do. You would hear people making it. But I think for the most part, the way it is, even with this little screen, it's got at the front of the, of the phone once you've kind of folded it. It's a little screen that you can, you know, do some quick replies on, make a quick phone call or whatever. But I, I, like, I think the fact that it's always kind of closed will kind of make, force you maybe to be less tethered to it in that regard, I think. You know, sometimes when people would have a, a normal iPhone or just a smartphone, you always kind of tap in the screen or, you know, tap in the wake and sleep button to make sure no one's met, you haven't messed any messages or whatever it may be. So maybe the fold will kind of uh, remove that. Um, and maybe just in general, the fact that it's so, I think, featureless, I think it's got maybe one of the slowest processors in it. It's not running the most up-to-date version of whatever Android's operating system that works with it. I think all these kind of things that are, would 
uh, normal tech reveal would say are hindrances and maybe something that kind of goes in its favor. It's essentially exactly what it says on the chin. On, it's exactly what it says on the chin, on the on the tin. Actually, it's got a massive chin. It's essentially a foldable smartphone in the shape of a razor that works really well. And I love the fact that they've got this other thing as well. They've got this skin that you can use to make it retro. Once you kind of use it, once you open it out, you can make it look like the old Motorola that had like essentially the LEDs around the keypads and shit that makes it look really cool. And again, I just hope going forward they don't end up, you know, stacking it full of features and essentially making it super good camera, super good screen, a super good fucking processor. I think part of the reason why this is going to work is because it's a little bit behind the times. It's a couple of steps backwards, but a couple of steps forward too with the addition of the foldable screen. And I think that's what people need now going forward. And again... The ball's firmly now in the other competitor's um, court. Because I don't think anyone would have expected Motorola to come out of the gate and smash it in terms of some hardware and making this phone look so amazing as it does now. Um, so now the ball is firmly in kind of Apple, Google, and these other smartphone manufacturers like Samsung's um, court to kind of push the smartphone model forward a bit. Because it's kind of got a bit stagnant. It's kind of got a bit stale. Everyone's kind of doing the same thing. The, sort of, the same sort of iPhone form factor that first got introduced in whatever 2000 whatever it was it's still kind of the same thing people are kind of going with right nothing's really changed that much for the most part so maybe this addition of foldable phones will kind of see us push things forward and maybe we might reach a point where we get to that point you know that um phone in um or the phones are using black mirror essentially like a piece of glass we might maybe get to that kind of level where we essentially just have a foldable plexi piece of glass as your phone that can change skin depending on what you want. You can buy it from the... I mean, like, all those kind of interactive things that we kind of hoped for when we watched those sci-fi movies might come into... might be something that will be uh, in reality, hopefully soon, sooner rather than later, um, it needs to be said. But I don't know, man. I quite like the range. Again, it's a really expensive price. So I think it's like $1,800 or some shit. Um, it's due to come out, I think, sometime in the new year as well. So it's something you could get right now. So that's something that kind of um, is not in its favor. But again, I think as a form factor, I think it's something to kind of be as a, a response to the deluge of smartphones that take your attention away from, you know, just interacting with your friends and family and just using your phone as a phone. This might be the answer. I'm a big fan of it. I like it. And I don't think I'd ever really think of use. I think Motorola as a brand kind of is similar to like Reebok for me. Do you know what I mean? It's like you never want it. It's not the cool brand to wear or to endorse. It's the kind of thing that you would have to wear when you don't have anything else in your wardrobe to wear. It's, you know, it's the kind of smartphone you'd have in your house where if you broke your iPhone or it was in repair, that's a phone you'd use. But this phone is fucking awesome. So much so that I would definitely consider having it as my main thing. Definitely, definitely consider having my main thing. So, yeah, I'm definitely a fan of it. The Motorola Razr is due to come out sometime in the new year. Um, it's going to be priced around, I think, $800. I think it mentioned on some sort of articles, but definitely check it out. MK, the MK, MKHD or B, whatever it is, has a really cool video out that um, kind of details a lot of the experience that he's had with it and some of the things that I like and don't like about it. So, definitely recommend you check that out if you're that way inclined. The Motorola Razr is out. Um, or it's coming out with a foldable screen. It's going to be amazing. It's going to push the smartphone sector forward. I think so. Next on the list, what do we have here? Uh, duh, 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 duh. Let's get into some trainers and shoes, actually. Let's get off that thing. Um, let's go into some shoes and trainers and see what we can talk about here. Duh, duh, duh. Oh, these Amy, these Ami Leon Door New Balances are really nice. Um, probably maybe I'd say easily one of my favorite uh, brands out there in terms of imagery in lookbooks that they use um, they have a very clear aesthetic a very clear style very clear design codes that kind of permeate throughout all the seasons there's a thread that kind of runs through them entirely and I think as a fairly fit a fairly alpha male in my respects I think it kind of really speaks to me I'm not sure why don't don't get into my mentions or whatever but i think it kind of speaks to me in that regard and i think this collection or this collaborative collection with new balance you know they've got whole capture collection in terms of clothing and shoes really kind of knocks it out the park and the imagery is really fucking cool um this is from hype b so it says amy um is it, is it, is it pronounced amy right or amy leon door launches official images of collaborative new balance apparel right um, it says the following, Emily and Dor has offered a closer look at the apparel collection that encompasses uh, its collaborative, that accompanies its, collab its collaborative New Balance. Ugh, the writing on in the hypebeast is fucking shit. Amy Leon Dor has offered a close look at the apparel collection that com com accompanies its coll collaborative New Balances. That's such a weird sentence, isn't it? Anyway, comprising a selection of comfy winter-friendly items, selection updates, a variety of classic sportswear silhouettes. 
just saying the same thing twice. Uh, double zipped fleeces, blah, blah. Anyway, we know, we can see the stuff with our eyes. So double zipped fleeces and some nice sweatpants, right? So cool stuff. But the lookbook is fucking beautiful at the top of the screen here. I'm going to put in a show notes for you guys to check out yourself. We essentially got this fairly cool looking model running down the street somewhere with a dog. Don't know what dog it is. I'm not a dog freak. But again, you dog freaks probably love this. Um, nice uh, mild gray sweatsuit, which might be the official color for fall this season. There's a lot of companies coming out with some really cool mild gray sweat, mild gray or gray sweat shirt, sweat suits. And um, I think now there's been a very, I don't know, maybe a few seasons back there was this real um, spike in hoodies. People just wearing hoodies with jeans. Now I've seen a real influx of, of companies selling suits, um, the tops and the bottom, sometimes together, sometimes separately, um, which has then kind of driven back this whole demand of having track suits. Of course, the UK rap scene guys have, have you know, there's no there's no video you can see now in Grand Delhi that doesn't have some sort of Nike, Nike tech suit um, in the background, whatever it may be, right? But these sort of track suits that are a little bit less roadman and maybe a little bit more, you know, a 24 hour fitness gym somewhere in the middle of Shoreditch. These are the things that I like, right? So, so that you can maybe go to a gym and, and maybe pop into a kind of coffee shop and not, you know, frighten the patrons because you've got your little gum bag on the side. I think these work really, really well. And so you've got that going on. You've got a really nice hat perched on the top of his head. I like how they styled that hat too. It doesn't really droop too far over, you know, just above the ears. And then you've got this nice detail of these fucking New Balances at the bottom, which look fucking cool. I've always been a big fan of New Balances when they have contrasting colors uh, on, the, on the laces. I think there's not been... I don't have any facts to prove this, but something that's kind of in my head. I don't think there's ever been a collaboration with New Balance that's contained a contrasting set of laces that hasn't been good. Any collaboration that has contrasting laces, the designers know what they're doing because the contrasting lace trick is a really good trick in order to kind of get some pop and to cover loads of to cover loads of surface area in your shoe without actually changing the color of the base. So you can essentially change the sil the silhouette and the overall kind of you know framework and the shape of a shoe just based on the colors that you put on it on the laces which is why maybe during a certain there was a period in time maybe it might have been just before the 2000s when Foot Locker used to sell those different color laces with the kind of silver and the frame in it they were really popular because essentially they kind of upgraded really basic air maxes to another level because you had these addition of these colorful laces that maybe match the essence on the shoe or maybe were a contrast to it they work really well so anytime you see a, a contrasting lace keep an eye on that shoe and definitely try and buy it um and then the next few images again you've got the model running through some fields kind of in the style of that justin timberlake album that was fucking dope shit man in the woods but this is a bit more of a better um example of that and again you got some nice uh sweatshirts and uh you got this amazing kind of shawl cover blanket thing with new balance logo you don't really see that much often of it maybe this might be because again collaborations are always a really good opportunity for brands to gauge the level of interest a particular item that they have in their archive so maybe for a long period of time i don't know why new balance hadn't put out much clothing i'm not sure if new balance do new balance put out a lot of clothing on their skateboarding side because i know they've 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 really pumped out the shoes in the new balance skateboarding division like they, they fucking go for it they're not fucking around i think it's just launched maybe a couple of seasons ago a couple of years ago the new balance skateboarding division now they've got you know a whole plethora of shoes so they don't rest on their laurels on that side so i reckon if, i wonder if they've got much clothing on that side whether they've got snapbacks or you know little bags and trousers and shit like chino type shits maybe they have but i think new balance are if any if if ever there was a brand that really needed to kind of level up its clothing or maybe just introduce it i think it's new balance i think they can kind of occupy the same area of space as champion where they're able to kind of you know just re-release classic um athletic wear uh, silhouettes you know hoodies sweatshirts sweat shorts running shorts um warm-up pants you know those kind of like quintessential pieces like just those 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 fleeces you've, you've seen those will work really well for New Balance. And again, they kind of are very much uh, a part of New Balance's image and New Balance's history. I think you can look back on a uh, whole plethora of archive images and find, you know, loads of these kind of moustache wearing 60s runners wearing these really short, short shorts and tiny vests. And they can easily kind of bring those back out again and people will be all over them, I reckon. I reckon so. Um, especially in the lifestyle, in the lifestyle di uh, division piece, or the in the lifestyle fitness area, I think there's a real good um, room there for New Balance to really kind of stake a claim and really kind of compete with the likes of Champion and all these other kind of brands out there. And also, it might be an opportunity for them maybe to make some blanks 
and to maybe supply uh, brands with the possibility of manufacturing some of their um, fleeces and stuff in their factories. That would be pretty cool, especially if they do some stuff in in the UK, like they've done with the Made in UK New Balances. Some of the brands I like to have their stuff made in the UK and have that stamp of approval could maybe use some of their factories, some size that way. That would be a really cool way, I think, going forward. But I'm a big fan of it, man. That clothing, the clothing looks fucking awesome. A really nice color pop on that yellow jumper just before. Some nice cool images of a house here, a dog. And then, of course, we've got the New Balances, right? And the New Balances look fucking, there's a really amazing, uh, is it Land Rover Defender? Yeah, Land Rover, I think it's Land Rover Defender, the old school kind of 4x4. Four four. Um, that's really popular. And again, see contrasting laces. Again, see the contrasting laces here. We've got two colorways. We've got the colorway with the yellow laces, and we've got this colorway here with like the green, dark blue upper. And a completely white midsole and outsole, which I'm not usually a fan of because I think it, they end up picking up dirt too much or end up kind of, you know, um, uh, be getting decolored. But maybe, maybe um, this color, this coloration, sorry, maybe this is part of the process. It's probably maybe doing a uh, inspiration from the Tom Sachs uh, Mars Yards, where essentially they've kind of, you know, they've essentially. I think he made it without coating the midsole, the outsole, so that it picks up dirt, so they look a bit more worn in. So you can't essentially keep them box fresh. Um, I like that. And then you got also on the other image, uh, on the other side, you've got one 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 pair with um, the blue laces, another pair with the white laces. Again, showing that uh, the switch in the laces really kind of adds a bit of pop to the overall shoe. But this, the, my favorite colorway definitely has to be the one that's like gray, green with the gray. So it's got essentially like a white midsole, uh, off-white midsole with like a crisp white outsole, which I'm, I quite like that combination actually looking at it now. Um, again easily one of the best collaborations i've seen of new balances this year really really up there some of the best stuff they've done um i'm sure there's a, a concentrated effort with new balance to kind of collaborate with loads of upcoming brands because there's no no coincidence that loads of brands have suddenly kind of been pushing out new balance um collaborations same with asics as well it looks like there's, they've um got somebody else in charge of the kind of special projects division maybe in that regard so that might be quite cool going forward but yeah i'm a big fan of these shoes i think they look fucking awesome um again i'm not sure how possible they're going to be uh to buy whether or not you're gonna have to kind of fucking sell a kidney, register your mom's maiden name to go and buy them, but they look fucking banging. And again, um, hopefully we see more of these and coming up from Amy and Doll. I think that this could be a collaboration that we keep seeing season in, season out. They could potentially keep, you know, they could potentially do this in the same vein that J. Crew did a lot of their New Balance collaboration. Remember, they do some pretty cool ones, and Steve Allen back in the day too used to do some pretty cool New Balance collaboration. Maybe you can see a lot of it. Maybe every season, New Balance just hit up um, Emily and Dor, Amy Leon Dor, and essentially you know offer them a chance to do a shoe and put it on the runway. You know that would be a cool way to kind of get these shoes out there and really boost their popularity. But again, I'm a big fan of them. They're going to be effective. They're available. I think last thursday so definitely check them out if you're that way inclined nine 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 zeros uh, in two really cool colorways so definitely check them out really really fun colorways and pieces from emily and door and i'm a big fan of them going forward man and again see like, what see what i mean about the how you um what colors you choose on the upper really kind of determines the shape the shape of these ones at the front just for um of, of the ones that kind of gray with green and white they look different just because of where the color placement has been placed so the front of this toe box has been colored differently to that just just those little kind of differences really change the overall structure of the shoe. Even this little pop on the heel, the yellow in tying in with the laces really change the overall makeup of them. Because I didn't know they were the same model. I thought they were a different model, a different shape. But they're, they're obviously not. I think that might be the instep of the shoe. It makes it look a bit different. But yeah, big fan of the shoe. Big fan of what they're doing. Big fan of the overall imagery that they use in the lookbook. And again, um, definitely recommend you check them out. They're available. What was that they said? So last Thursday, right? So definitely check them out. Um, New Balance and Emily and Door collaboration coming right at you, coming right at you again. This is the fleeces, right? Nice sweatpants and all the clothing. They've got some nice uh, sweatshirts here, jumpers, great hoodies. Again, the little logo on the chest pocket. Just very cleverly and very subtly done. Nothing too crazy. Just really nice complimentary pieces that go really well with the shoes. The the colorway for the fucking sweats is really nice, isn't it? All white, mild grey, and a really bright yellow. And I like the fact that they've got the same color logo on all three. Just change the essence colorway, right? I think that's the stitching on the yellow or the for the just underneath the actual font for New Balance is white instead of the yellow. Yeah, I like it, man. I like all of it. All of it looks really cool. So whoever's doing the collaborative work at New Balance and is putting out these projects, you deserve a little pat on the shoulder. Um, my friend, um, keep up the good work. This is fucking cool, man. Good good to see. Hopefully the, the kids out there as well react well to them too. I'm not sure if it matters as well because I think there is a big market out there for guys who just want to wear cool shoes that don't necessarily want to buy Yeezys and shit or buy something that looks like, you know, it's been chucked into a fucking blender. 
but I like this. It looks really cool. Good, Im good imagery, good use of materials, good use of colors. And again, um, I'm sure, pretty sure they'll be readily available for most people to buy because they're not Yeezys. And so if you're that way inclined, definitely check them out. Nice collab, nice collab. Uh, moving on. What else we have here? Oh, we have these shoes, right? These are um, um, Lauren Halsey. I'm not sure who Lauren Halsey is. I think she's an artist. It seems like from a quick Google that I did. But in terms of the overall shoe and not concerning the actual artist that collaborated them, even though the collaboration is a big part of understanding why the shoe looks the way it does, just objectively as a shoe, these are fucking banging. I love them. So essentially, it's an, it's an all-black Air Force One. So you know I'm always game. Um, with some very clever little sparks of color and little bits of detail that really kind of make it pop. You've got this weird kind of like, no, you've got this kind of essentially like a dark blue um, outsole. So essentially it's all black, dark blue outsole. And then the, like, the thing that I like that makes it interesting is that the upper isn't just all one material. It's uh, essentially, I think you've got maybe a combination of suede and nubuck or nubuck and tumbled leather at the back of the shoe. And then the swoosh looks like it's removable, but it's patent black. So you've got a whole black upper with all these different materials that gives it a little shine. You've got a little bit of an embroidery at the back heel. And then also you've got the addition of these um, rainbow colored or gradient colored um, laces that go from black to green and orange on either side. And then you've got this really interesting strap at the top of the Air Force One, which is most, uh, most akin to the strap you might have found on the, on the Concept 2 row machine. Like you kind of clip it and pull it along like those kind of clip it belts, which I think might be a better way to strap an Air Force One as opposed to the regular version that we have now at the moment that kind of goes through a loop and it's basically a Velcro sort of strap. Um, I think this is still Velcro, but I like the fact that it's got like a clip on it so you can basically feed it through and then clip it on the back. That looks really cool. I, I'm a big fan of it because I'm not really a fan of how people wear the Air Force Ones. The classic way is you essentially take the strap off and have the loop hanging from the back um, or you just take the hoop off, loop off um, um, all together or if you want to have that style you essentially wear the air force one mid which is you know a bit of a cheat i think you should only be wearing lows or highs or you get the air force one mid that has the strap that's a little bit more it's got more of a shape so you can just wear it a bit open right that kind of style of wearing but i'm a big fan of this shoe man um this is news from sneaker news it says lauren halsey brings um afro futurism and funk to a purposeful um, Air Force One high. Um, the text is the following, the, curve, the convergence of art and footwear. Uh, Nike's latest modification of the Air Force One high lies largely reversed on the surface, yet loud just underneath with its finger on the pulse of Lauren Halsey's thought provoking messages. Um, her artwork deals with class and systemic oppression of both the LGBTQ and African American communities alike, speaking out with pieces such as what if we owned or with the sprawling mosaics of gotta get over the hump. So let's definitely just check this um Lauren Halsey out and see what kind of artwork they do because it's been talking a big game. Let's see what we think of the actual artwork. But the shoes objectively are fucking cool. I'm a big fan of them. Okay, I love the art. Just looking at it from the images on Google. Images look pretty cool. Um, so again, really cool collaboration. Look, I wonder why she got a collab with Nike though. I wonder what the premise is. Usually they don't really fly these collabs for any reason. They usually might be uh activation tied with it. Maybe she's gonna do an exhibition sponsored by Nike. But it's interesting collab because I've not really heard of her. Maybe she's very popular in LA. Um, but again, maybe again it's a, it's a good indication that someone at working and like has their finger on the pulse, was able to recognize somebody that's doing some good work on a kind of you know, it's bubbling um up on the surface and kind of gave them a shot and gave them a chance and gave them a collab. Because these collabs, even though for us customers it might be a bit dry and a bit, you know, a bit tiresome, they they do serve as a good opportunity for the artists themselves to really gain some traction and really get their name out there, right? It does really kind of um alert everyone, especially uh, especially people that don't know how their finger on the pulse. You're essentially being provided with a platform form to kind of spread your message and kind of put yourself out there again and get other brand deals of course it might be a bit difficult with other sports brand because once you've signed with nike it's hard to go back and kind of you know um sign with adidas or whatever it may be or sometimes you might sign an exclusivity deal that might uh, might kind of block you from doing that but i think other brands in other industries will see that um nike badge of approval and also want to align with you in some respect shape or form especially nowadays in this capitalist world we live in where you know un unfortunately the lgbtq message has been co-opted and now people are using it as a kind of essentially a market employee right there's no office in liverpool street that i've seen during you know um, gay pride that doesn't have their logo changed to the fucking lgbtq rainbow even though some of their employees or some of their directors or some of their actions will be very much against that whole community in the first place but you know that's neither here or there let's go back to the shoe um the shoe itself they continue ba 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 
The article says, what if we get off this hump, continuing a headstrong to a wider audience with help of now removable sushis of the Beaverton staple. The black dress uppers bear a texture of suede or smooth leathers lining and lying next to a, a bold face type that says uh, Suma Everything. The artist handle for her private Instagram account while expressive. Oh, that's quite cool, isn't it? She's got, a, she's got her own Instagram account username on the side of a shoe that's private. So you can't even look at it yourself. So you can't even... So maybe she's going to gain some followers. This might be a cool way to do a collab, isn't it? So you know on the, on the tongue, instead of changing the tongue to your logo or changing the fucking, the heel tab to your logo, maybe have on the back of it your fucking um, Instagram um, at, um, that would be pretty cool going forward, isn't it? That would be fucking awesome. I'll, I love that. Um, straps at the top line are nothing of the ordinary, particularly revealing this inner thread throughout the whole translucent window. The tongue sport a punchy graphics, neighborhood autonomy and pride, speaking out of unison of vibrant imagery of the culture rich all over print, tucked away in the insole. Grab a good look at her and take just right below. Jesus Christ, writing on this website is horrible, but I think maybe this is just from the press release or some sort of word lottery. But yeah, it looks amazing. I'm a big fan of them. Three piece, three different materials on the upper. A nice removable uh, patent solution on the side. So if you don't want any branding and you just want to keep it nice and mellow, you can. Uh, a really cool strap at the top and these great laces. I'm a big fan of them, man. Again, you, you're not going to get me saying anything wrong about uh, all black Air Force One. Easy wear shoes to wear, especially if you want to go rub an off license somewhere. Definitely check them out if you're that way inclined. I fucking love them. Great shoe. And they're going to be out when? December December 7th. So a few a few weeks to go. Um, again, a shoe that isn't going to be that hyped. Not a lot of people are going to be wanting to resell it. But as just an objective shoe to have in your wardrobe, that's really cool. That looks amazing. Get them now. And again, I'm saying it now before someone cool wears them and everyone starts fucking wanking over them. Get them now. Make it on mind that be a thought leader. Don't go for the easy, safe thing. Try and make a difference and wear something more interesting. I like the fact they've got metal eyelets at the top and not at the bottom. wonder why that is. See, right here at the top, there's metal eyelets and the bottom there isn't. Hmm, interesting. I don't really like metal eyelets on my shoes in general. I think it makes it the shoe look a bit too formal. It ends up looking like a wingtip. Is it me? Maybe it's not only just me, but I'm not really a fan of the metal eyelets. But yeah, check these shoes out. A cool collaboration with Lauren Halsey. Um, Afro, Afrofuturism Air Force One High. That's not what they called though, right? They called the, uh, yeah, Summer Everything. So yeah, definitely check those out. Out December the 7th. At all your regular sneaker spots, I'm assuming, in it probably. Anyway, that's an hour of the Excellent Singer podcast, episode number 253. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company. As always, if you need anything from me and you want to get in contact, please leave a comment on the YouTube uh, comments. Maybe send me an email. You can find those details on my website, excellentzingle.com. If you listen via podcast app, a five star review will go a long way to help spread the show. If you're watching via the YouTube app or the YouTube website, wherever it may be, you leave me a thumbs up, subscribe, leave me a comment below. But until then, I'll see you guys very, very soon. Take care, be safe. Bye bye. <laughs>